It's well known that Adolf Hitler and Nazi-era Germany imbibed a toxic ideology. What's also recently come to light is that while espousing a supposedly racially and physically pure creed, many in the Third Reich were often hopped up on hard drugs. Not just civilians, but soldiers and even Hitler himself were taking cocaine, heroin, and methamphetamines, to name just a few. These remarkable historical discoveries are laid out in a new book by German novelist turned historian Norman Oler. It's called Blitzed, Drugs in Nazi Germany, and we are pleased to welcome Norman Oler to our studio. Willkommen. Wie geht es heute? Very good, thank you. I'm happy to be here. I speak German to you and you answer me in English. That's very disappointing to me. <laughs> Anyway, let's start, Norman, by having you paint us a picture of German society back in the 1930s and 40s and talk to us about how enamored much of society was with hard drugs at that time. Well, I mean, it starts in the 20s uh, in the um, so-called Weimar Republic, which was a very open um, era. It was the, the first German uh, democracy from 1918 to 33. And, um, it was a society that had to cope with the um, after effects of the last First World War. Um, many people were um, suffering from depression, actually. Many men came back from the battlefields wounded, um, still addicted to morphine. So that, that's a time when, when drugs are a very important um, aspect of the, of the society, also of the culture in uh, Berlin uh, of the 20s, uh, the famous uh, crazy 20s in Berlin. And then when the Nazis take power in 33, they, they, they stop all of that. Uh, they are, in a way, the first anti-drug government. Um, they, in, in a way, also invent the war on drugs. And then the big irony is that in the mid-30s, uh, a company develops a product uh, that they label as pervitin, and that product becomes hugely popular then. Pervitin is how you say it? I think, what would we call it here? I think we call you, it something else. You might say... You might say pervitin, but what's actually interesting is what is inside of pervitin. What are the ingredients? And well, the only ingredient is methamphetamine. Methamphetamine being uh, a German invention of this uh, one company called Temla. It was patented in October 1937 and came onto the market in 1938 and quickly became extremely popular. It's a very powerful stimulant, obviously. And um, what does it do for you? Um, it once it is. Once it reaches your brain, um, it releases the neurotransmitters uh, noradrenaline and dopamine, which makes your brain or makes you feel um, extremely alert. You think it's kind of putting you in a situation. It's like being in a, da in a dangerous situation, but there actually is no danger. So all your senses are heightened and you, you are, um, you're wide awake. So if you take that in a, in a, if you took pervitin in a normal situation, you felt the mood elevation, and um, it, uh, people used it for all kinds of, of tasks, just like going, in, going into a meeting, in a, into a business meeting, or party, party members going to a, into a party meeting. And they laced chocolates with it. Well, this just shows you how popular it was um, at the time that um, the company uh, sold their, their license to uh, a chocolate uh, brand called Hildebrand, which uh, put out these chocolates. And each little uh, piece of chocolate contained 13 milligrams of pure methamphetamine. And this was marketed for the German housewives and uh, probably led to extreme cl extremely clean uh, homes in Germany because on that, on that stuff you are uh, very much energized. So the Nazis uh, publicly are scorning drugs, but privately you discover they're handing out hard drugs by the millions to their soldiers to enhance their abilities. And here is how you describe it in your book. Let's read this excerpt. The night brightened, no one would sleep, lights were turned on, and the lindworm, a serpent-like monster, of the Wehrmacht started eating its way tirelessly towards Belgium. Something started happening. An intense chill crept across scalps. A hot feeling of cold filled everyone from within. There were no more breaks. An uninterrupted chemical bombardment had broken out in the cerebrum. In the body released greater quantities of nutrients, boosting its sugar production so that the machine was running at maximum output and the pistons were going up and down exponentially. Can you talk to us about, I mean, the Blitzed is obviously a play on the Blitzkrieg, uh, but I, I, I want to get a sense of how much of the Nazis' initial success, and they were very successful at the beginning of World War II, do you attribute to the fact that 
so many of the soldiers were using hard drugs. Well, there was one um, professor, his name is Otto Ranke. He was responsible for performance enhancement of the army, and he was, uh, he was finding out in 38 that um, civilian population is taking pervitin in order to combat fatigue, and fatigue was his number one enemy. He, he was always trying to figure out a way to make a soldier uh, able to, to fight longer periods of time. So he made tests with uh, pervitin before the war started and realized if you take this stuff, you don't have to go to bed at 10 at night. You can actually stay awake for two days without stopping. Uh, and um, the, the German strategy then uh, in the West was to go through the Aden Mountains. Uh, and, and this strategy was, was in a way, in a way advent, it, was an, it, was, it was an adventure uh, in, in, that, in that respect that they had to actually reach the French heartland within three days and three nights. That was the goal. Mm -hmm. And they couldn't stop during those three days and three nights. So the methamphetamine um, uh, is, is tuned into that strategy. And um, before the campaign starts on May 10th, 1940, 35 million dosages um, of methamphetamine are distributed uh, to the Germans. Uh, to the to the front lines, uh, the German army is actually the first army in the world um, to have uh, such a drug in an organized fashion. Well, here's the statistic: in less than a hundred hours, Germany gained more territory than they had in four years of World War One. You think because of the drugs? Well, the drugs helped the strategy. The strategy was very risky because they weren't sure if they would reach France within three days and three nights. If they would take longer, then the British and the French defenders could have crushed them in the middle. Um, so the trick really was to keep awake these soldiers for that uh, period of time. And um, there was one tank general, Guderian, and he said to his men, uh, I order you to stay awake for three days and three nights. And if, you, if you've ever tried that, it's basically impossible, mm -hmm. but with methamphetamine it is possible. So you can say without methamphetamine the whole plan would have fallen apart. So it is a, it is a very crucial um, piece of the puzzle. I read in your book 17 straight days some stayed awake for? That's what, how uh, Guderian addressed his men after the successful campaign. He said you actually managed to do it for 17 days and 17 nights, which might be a little bit exaggerated, but it kind of shows you the general uh, thing that, that, that was happening on the ground and also, also in the air. The Air, air Force pilots were also using uh, methamphetamine. Let's, uh, Sheldon, put these pictures up uh, that we have here and tell us what we're seeing. Well, these are actually sleeping soldiers uh, because um, the, the Army wasn't sure what, what, what actually happens to you after you've been awake for such a long time. So they, they went to the front lines after the six, this, these photos are taken after the, after the victory mm -hmm. and they found that everyone's asleep kind of making up for, um, for what they had been awake uh, before. What kind of side effects did the soldiers experience? Well, obviously, uh, they become dependent on it, psychologically dependent, because uh, they feel so elevated while on the drug that once the drug wears off, they want to take it again. Um, also, the drug was known to reduce fear. So uh, whenever there's a new battle situation, they, they want to use the drug again, so they're they are more they're fearless. Um, also, it increases your heart rate tremendously. So it was a problem for older officers over 40. There were uh, heart attacks and... Uh, what about depression? Well, depression uh, was, uh, was, became a mass phenomenon and uh, then uh, more methamphetamine was being used. So this, this especially became a problem in the very long war against the Soviet Union. Were the Allies also using chemicals to keep their soldiers in better shape? Well, the Nazis were the pioneers. They, they had the idea first, and they were the only ones uh, in the beginning of the war to use that to their great advantage. Uh, for example, the um, French army, supposedly the strongest army in the world at the time, still had their uh, drug regulations from the First World War, and that meant that every French soldier received three quarters of one liter of red wine per day. That was their, that was their drug. But, mm -hmm. Um, once the first planes were shut down over Great Britain, um, and in those planes uh, uh, they discovered methamphetamine, uh, the Royal Air Force um, had their own program and tried to evaluate whether they should also give something to their men. And then later in the war, uh, they decided on giving amphetamines, which is not as strong as methamphetamine, but you can see that they learned uh, from, the, uh, from the Nazi uh, experience. And even after World War II, um, 
modern armies, the American army, for example, has been using uh, amphetamines in order to keep their soldiers more awake and um, better in their so-called mm. job. Now, Norman, your book has become incredibly controversial, not just because of what you've told us already, but because you apparently have uncovered evidence that suggests that Adolf Hitler and much of the senior Nazi leadership, uh, while professing in public not to, um, you know, drink or smoke or eat meat, but privately were hepped up on some of the hardest drugs that were out there. So tell us, why did Hitler start to try to chemically enhance his life? Well, Hitler always thought of himself as a, basically a health freak. Uh, who, he didn't drink alcohol, he didn't eat meat, he didn't drink coffee. And um, when he met a certain doctor, uh, his name is Theo Morell in 1936, and learned that that doctor was a specialist in um, injecting vitamins, he thought he found the right guy because he considered this to be uh, enhancing uh, his uh, uh, healthy diet. So um, Morell becomes the, the personal physician of Hitler. As a, Morell was a kind of celebrity doctor before that in Berlin and was, was kind of a doctor feel good. Is Morell in that shot? Well, Morel's the, the guy uh, in the back uh, looking over, over... The bald man behind yeah, Hitler. Yeah, that's, that's okay. correct. And he becomes the personal physician of Hitler in 1936 and gives him one to two injections a day until 1941. Injections of what? Mostly vitamins and glucose. And then in 41, that changes and he starts uh, 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 giving also horm hormone injections, steroids. Um, and in 41, also for the first time, an opiate, uh, optalidone. When Hitler uh, has, uh, has, a, has the flu and can't go to the military briefing, he requests something stronger uh, than vitamins. And that is when uh, the game changes. And uh, because once he has this, opium, uh, this opiate uh, in his bloodstream, he's able to go into the briefing room and, uh, and, and he, he learns from that, from that success and from Especially 43 to the end of 44, he receives um, a lot of uh, what we today know as opioids, half synthetic opiates. Um, we this all know is that. Eucodal you're talking about? Yeah, Eucodal is the brand name at the time in Germany. Um, in uh, Canada and the United States, I think it's called oxy. Yeah, oxycodone. Yeah, it's oxycodone. Heavy stuff. And Hitler receives in the beginning 10 milligrams intravenously and after. Um, July 20th, 1944, the bomb attack against him in the wolf's lair, he, he doubles that dose to 20 milligrams intravenously um, every other day in the fall of 1944 for a longer period of time. Uh, that's, that's heavy drug use. How widespread was the knowledge at the time that Hitler was using these kinds of hard drugs? Well, within the inner circle, it didn't take very long that people became very suspicious of Morel, the doctor, mm -hmm. because Morel and Hitler didn't uh, tell anybody what was actually going on between them. Hitler, there's one statement by Hitler saying that in Germany, um, the patient and the doctor do not have to disclose what is going on mm -hmm. among them. He even uh, attended military briefings, which was highly unusual, and the generals hated that uh, because he had no place in that room. He was not a military man. He was just basically Hitler's private uh, physician. But his, um, his influence became stronger and stronger because the drugs that he gave Hitler became stronger and stronger. There were attempts to remove him. Uh, Martin Bormann, Himmler, they, they were very jealous. Uh, because Morel was closer to Hitler than themselves, and they were very suspicious what's actually going on. Is that good that the Führer is receiving injections every day we don't know anything about? Because that he received injections was clear. It was just not clear what was in those. Mm -hmm. So they tried to remove him. They tried to install other doctors. But Hitler always uh, stood to his dealer. He would not let him go. And here's what you tell us was the impact of those injections. When patient A, Hitler, stepped onto his pharmacologically created Mount Olympus, Imagining that his thoughts were crystal clear and that he could rearrange the world to his own liking, it was impossible for his generals to get through to him. The medication kept the Supreme Commander stable in his delusion, built up an impregnable defense that nothing could penetrate. Any doubts were swept away by his chemically induced confidence. The world could sink to rubble and ashes around him, and his actions could cost millions of people their lives. But the Fuhrer felt more than justified when his artificial euphoria set in. 
Tell us more about how Hitler's drug use affected his decision making in the middle 1940s. Well, first of all, we have to understand that his ideology and the basis for his decision making are not linked to drugs. They are linked to his racist ideology, which he developed in the 20s, which he laid out in his book, Mein Kampf, My Struggle. Mm -hmm. um, but what we, what we do see is that at a time later on in the war, when especially his gen generals tell him to change tactics, to, to make him realize that the reality actually on the, on the Eastern Front especially is very different than the dream world that Hitler has in his head. And in, the, in those instances, uh, he discusses with Morel what to take before those meetings when he confronts these, let's say, 30 uh, rational thinking Prussian Wehrmacht uh, generals who try to, to change the outcome of the war. And then he uses um, very specifically, especially this oikodal. Oikodal is this euphoric making opioid and uses it in order to enhance his, the old charisma that once he had, had naturally, uh, that had been able to convince everybody, he now needs an artificial stimulant in order to, be, to still be able uh, to convince people, and it actually works. Uh, after those meetings, uh, I read uh, reports from generals in, in their diaries where they write, the Führer was so convincing, he, he knows things we just don't know. Uh, he, he, just, uh, he, just, he was just, he was able to, um, uh, to, to tell us that uh, he, he is still on the right track, and, and we can see that he was, was using uh, drugs in order to be in that enhanced uh, state of mind. Here he is nearing the end of the war. Once again, Sheldon, this excerpt, please. Drugs were fuel and a stand-in for a lack of commitment. By now, he found that his illusions could be bolstered only by narcotics. He traveled from headquarters to headquarters, unbounded, homeless, always on his way to the next futile military action, the next fix that would let him repress all consequences. He moved in a permanent fog, a doped-up performance athlete unable to stop until the inevitable collapse. Okay, Norman, again, one of the reasons that the book has become so controversial is that some people are ascribing to you a motive which suggests that you're somehow, by putting this information forward, getting Hitler off the hook for his most egregious decisions and somehow saying, well, he was addicted to drugs, therefore this makes it somehow less egregious. That's the accusation. Do you want to speak to that? Well, first of all, I'm listing facts and I'm, I'm doing research and I'm not, um, I'm, not, I'm not trying to excuse anything and I don't think I am excusing anything um, because, as I said before, um, motives, actions, decision-making, planning. It predated the drugs. Yeah, this, is, this has nothing to do with drugs. It's not like Hitler was a rational uh, Politician. That's what actually what Chamberlain still thought in, in 38 that we can we can we can deal with Hitler. Mm -hmm. He just he just wants to have a stable and strong Germany, but it's going to be fine. But Hitler was always uh, uh, and this has nothing to do with drugs and in, in, in insanely cruel planning uh, mass murderer. So um, the, so there's the, nothing to the notion that had he not been on drugs, he might have been a more normal enemy as opposed to the maniac he was. No, I mean, had he not been on drugs, maybe he would have collapsed earlier or, I mean, it's hard to imagine he would change his mind or listen to anybody. Um, I think it's actually impossible to imagine the, that, that late Hitler without drugs. The drugs, the drugs just, just fit in with his, uh, uh, with his set personality and uh, with his addictive uh, personality, but it, it, doesn't, it doesn't let him off the hook at all. Can you tell us about the moment when you were looking through the archives and you realized that you had found documents that would truly change seven decades of how we understood Hitler to be at that time? What was that moment like? Well, that was in the Federal Archives in um, Germany when I was reading through those files and, and also had re realized that those f files that the doctor had put together had not been looked at for decades. I was quite surprised about that because I think Morel is the key to enter that inner room and understand more uh, what is going on there. There's a sample of one of the documents that you would have found. Can you help us through that? 
Well, for example, on the right side, uh, we see uh, Oikodal um, being mentioned here. This is a patient card uh, of Morel. And um, so we, we, can, we can basically read uh, on what days um, he was taking Oikodal. And in addition to those patient cards, uh, there, there, there are uh, other records uh, that, that, that list every day. So every day is, is pretty much recorded. This, this is a card from, um, from 1944. Uh, this was actually, this actually incorporates uh, the uh, attempt on his life on the, the 20th of July. Uh, we see that in the left-hand corner where uh, it's, it says uh, attempt on, on Hitler's life, July 20th. Um, but he's basically getting, it looks to that like he's getting 10 injections a week. He's popping pills like crazy. Well, he used over 90 different medications, and he received one to two injections a day. He, he, did, he basically started his day around 11, 11.30 uh, with uh, rolling up the sleeve of his pajama and calling uh, Morellin and receiving the first injection. Not all injections were opioids, but quite a lot of injections were opioids. And um, so... Uh, Tell me this. How, how is it that we haven't known this story as well as we now do? Well, I think historical sciences um, are evolving. And uh, probably in the 70s and 80s, when many of the important books about the time were written, the historians, because the, the so-called Third Reich is a very complex phenomenon, we're looking at different things. We're looking at the ideology and at the uh, the economy and at the, uh, I mean, the, drugs are not the first thing you look at. Um, but uh, I think without the drugs, especially uh, looking at how the drugs uh, help the German army, um, it is very difficult to understand, to really understand what was going on. Um, so I think historians have uh, have missed out somehow on they this, this, one. this topic. Maybe. I, I work very closely with the German historian Hans Mommsen on, on my book, um, one of the leading historians on National Socialism, perhaps the authority in, in, in Germany. And uh, when I entered his study with uh, hundreds of uh, copies from the archives, uh, he was absolutely amazed. And um, he uh, supported me and uh, helped me structure the book. And he told me, uh, he said, well, he's an older gentleman. He said, well, we historians, we don't know anything about drugs, so we never really think it could be of importance to, to, okay, try, so to try to understand how a soldier feels or so auto you're stimulant. So you're a younger guy. So you understand the drug culture a little better than maybe somebody in their 70s or 80s would. Tell me this, did you, did you sample any of the drugs that Hitler would have taken to get a sense of how it worked? Well, I wrote the book on green tea. That's my <laughs> drug of choice. Um, I but see. I am socialized in Berlin and especially in Berlin in the Berlin of the 90s and I have many friends who have uh, drug experiences and I, I spoke to uh, many people and um, I see a lot of things and uh, I would certainly say I know a lot more about drugs than a normal historian in his ivory tower in a small university town in Cambridge or Oxford um, I mean maybe that changes but I think when those people were writing these books it was a totally different Mm -hmm. Time than than now when when while I was while I was uh, working on Blitz and I think that 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 really helped me to understand the, the subject matter and, and get closer to the to to what might have actually happened. The name of the book is Blitzed: Drugs in Nazi Germany. Norman Oler. Danke schön, mein Freund. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.